Okay, um, we're going to wrap up this last talk. We should have time for uh, questions and a little bit of panel questions. The, uh, we're going to talk about understanding aging. We, I briefly touched upon this in the last talk, and it's just sort of understanding where aging goes. And if you look at this example here, there's, the temptation is that there's dramatic halasis and brow ptosis, but if you really look carefully at this image, I think it's relatively controlled for, uh, for position. You can see that there's actually the same height here and here, and the same height here and here, although it looks so obvious that the brow has fallen. And the skin is probably down about a millimeter, but it actually is retracted upwards about a millimeter on this side. What's obvious is the, the exposure of the orbital rim. So we have to start seeing differently, and what the goal is to start seeing negative space, starting to see things that are not there, instead of seeing things that are there. Like we think there may be a jowl here, but it actually is shrunken upwards onto the mandible. So it's just sort of seeing the opposite. A shorter time frame of early to late 30s, if you look at this, you can see that there's just more orbital exposure of bone, a little bit of exposure up to the upper cheek, that transition you heard Mark talk about, and then around the mouth is just more bone exposure. So it's rethinking what is aging. If you look, let's do this. If you think about aging from a different paradigm, I like to communicate this well to my patients that it's a glass of water emptying. I think it's an easy way for people to understand that. If you think of it that way, basically all it is is that we're just losing fat from birth until death. Now obviously certain areas of our face with metabolic slowdown gets larger, but the majority around the periorbital region, anterior chin, starts to lose fat, and it's just a relative hollowing. And a lot of women are not necessarily enamored with the way they look in their early 20s because there can be too much baby fat. So, and if you try to even replicate that with a lot of volume, I think they just look too full, and it doesn't look right because you can't exactly reverse aging. So the goal is to fill that glass of water. If you're a younger person, you're putting less in. If you're an older person, you're putting more in. And in terms of volumes that I put in, if I'm seeing someone in their mid-30s even or late 30s, I'm putting maybe 15 to 20 cc's in. If, and this is a lot more conservative volumes, but everyone has different volumes to get different results. Um, and if someone's older, I may be putting 45 to 50 cc's in. And it's just, it's just an overall way of thinking. I want to talk to you a little bit about what we heard Mark talk about, blink effect, and I think it's really how do we judge someone's age even at 20 to 30 feet away. And it has very little to do with right it has very little to do with hanging skin. It has to do with facial shape. And so what you see is that from a distance, someone that's very, very young, a child, a baby, has a very, very round face. And as we continue, that roundness maintains itself through the teenage years, no matter how thin the body is, and even into the early 20s, it's still quite round. As we start to lose volume into our mid-20s, there's this hybrid effect where you're starting to have some buccal suppression that begins in our early to late 20s to early 30s to become more dominant as a triangle, and then there's greater further suppression by our early to mid 30s. And if you ask most women, they actually like themselves in their early to mid 30s because they're a little bit more sculpted than their early uh, 20s. As we get Older, we start to lose volume to the anterior chin, to the upper recess of the cheeks, and we get to get bonier along the mandible area. So there's squaring effect of the face that's a masculinization process. So if you think about, you know, men as they get older, they become more masculine, and so do women. So you want to be careful in particular when you're working with men and making them too feminized by making them too youthful. And that's a discussion that you have to use some old photos to determine. And then there's an inversion where the lower face starts to dominate and you start to get that line that you heard Mark talk about. We go down to the lower portion of the face and there's a, a dominance of our lower face and that triangle becomes accentuated. Um, and with greater periorbital advancement and hollowing into the mid-cheek and around the eyes into the anterior chin and the buccal recess, there's a full inversion of the triangle. And that's what we see even from 20, 30 feet away. We've already made our judgment. And, and that's what I see when my patients come through the door. I've already made my judgment about my work 30 feet away because it, either it looks good or it doesn't from that, from that distance. So the goal is inverting the triangle. We're going to talk about a little subtle change. And what I like to think about actually is more of an ovalization. And this component that bridges the cheek to the chin is the buccal zone, which to me is a very, very important area to create sort of a nice natural oval that's a transition sort of between the triangle and the circle. So creating ovals, designing facial balance. I don't think it's rocket science to do this, but it is something that if you start to train your eye, you start to see differently. 
An example of a lady that has very, very strong cheekbones. So this is actually avoiding the cheekbone and filling more into the central face, a little bit of buccal transition. So if you fill around the cheek itself, this cheek actually looks smaller and more blended into the face. The anterior chin component, I think an area that we tend to forget because we always are focused on the jowl and low down here, but the absence of tissue near the mouth across here, not the fold, but the bony exposure here is actually what accentuates aging. So a padded chin can look very dynamically youthful. 48-year-old lady here, if you look at it, teaching you negative space is to move away from it, uh, an eye bag or steatoblepharon, moving away from dermatochalasis and a brow ptosis, and even a jowl. Because what you're seeing instead is an exposable rim, a deflated brow, a, a full lower cheek where this is starting to empty out, and bone of the anterior chin. And so we're seeing differently. The goal today is to see negative space. And I really think that buccal transition point here allows me to get a more fluid transition into the lower face. So the more you think about transition zones of the face, I think the better that you're going to start to see how to rejuvenate a face. This is the opposite. This is taking a face that's relatively wide in aspect and actually narrowing it by avoiding the buccal space and putting more in the pre-jowl, anterior chin, anterior cheek, and into the brow, and I would say the lower eyelid's a little bit underdone, but you can sort of see overall the effect of getting the right balance, and the face just looks thinner. The goal is to say is how does light interact? You heard this earlier, and I want to sort of th have you think about, this is so critical, is that's how I really think at even 35 feet away, 25 feet away, you can tell someone's age, well before you can see a single righted. It's about how light interacts, and the way that I like to think about it is that we don't want to look like Nick Nolte after a bad night out in the town. And it's about, the concept is that if you really think about it, when there's volumetric collapse of the face, we never look good. It, 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 if we create the right volume balance of the face, face, no matter what makeup we have, what sleep, we always look good. And that's the way that light interacts. Well, how does light interact with the skin is the question. Well, it's quite simple. It's top down. So if you really think about this, we live in a, in a world with always top down lighting. So if you think about what that means to you, is that if you can get in a situation, except that Neiman Marcus dressing room, you want to get a beautiful result in this situation, whether it's outside or inside. So how does light interact with the face? Well, if you think about it, deflation of the face creates more shadows. And if you're just lifting this deflated balloon, you're creating actually more shadows at certain times and less shadows elsewhere, whereas filling in all these transition points we talked about creates uniformity, and that's how light interacts better because it's top down. So if we live in a world with top-down lighting, the way that I photograph my patients, if you say, well, he's not using consistent lighting, I am. It's actually a room with no ambient light, no flash photography, a uniform embankment of lights across it, and it's actually real-world simulation, in my opinion. It's so important, and you should judge your work, not close up. Well, of course, part of that, but you need to judge it at a distance, and that's where I want you to think about. How, does fat last? And, and it, there's this controversy that it just is just some kind of restylane filler. It absolutely is not. If it's done well, it actually is longevity. I like, this, I like the saying that the only complications you get are when fat survives. And the best way to think about it, I do a lot of hair restoration. I start to think of fat in the model of hair. And I was reading Unger's book, and I was thinking neovascularization for a hair transplant starts at about six months formally. And of course you go through these other phases of primary, secondary inosculation. And, and, but you get neovascularization formally being very, very robust at six months. And I started to really rigorously look at my photographic evaluation of my patients, and I start to see the results actually uptick at that point. So the goal is to say, how do I see volume shifts over time? The trap we fall into is at three months we go, uh-oh, it didn't survive. What we don't do is follow them over years. And so the problem with this is, in my opinion, we can get them overfilled at this point when we get into the fifth and sixth year across this way. So the way that I like to communicate with my patients is that there can be a dip and expect it. And if they expect it, they won't be worried about it. And so I see my patients at one or two weeks look dramatically overfilled. At three to four weeks, in my opinion, they look pretty darn good, and sometimes too good because all the wrinkles are stretched out. And then at about three months to six months, they're in this dip phase where the fat cells shrink a little bit, but the formal blood supply really begins somewhere in the fourth, fifth month, 
and it continues with a trajectory up to about 18 months to two years. And so long as there's not excessive aging that occurs over that two-year arc, they're improving and improving. And then what happens, like that glass of water idea, there's just a little bit further aging. And again, all of this has to be factored into the idea that they're actually aging like this the whole time, but there's just this little arc of improvement. So some photographs to show you this. A lady that's 48 years old, she already had a, 